So today's conversation is going to be around the topic of asset management. So just as a refresher for those of you, of you in the audience, I just want to cover off some points to, to, so that we're all talking about the same thing. So IT asset management, ITAM as it's sometimes called, is the practice of managing and tracking an organization's IT assets throughout their entire, entire life cycle. Sometimes people call that cradle to grave. It involves the systematic approach of acquiring the assets, deploying them, maintaining them, and of course, disposing of them in a secure manner. Um, and those assets include such things as hardware, software, network devices, and even licenses for your software. Now, the primary goal of asset management is to optimize the use, cost, and value of the assets while ensuring compliance with regulatory requirements, thus minimizing risk. So you really you know, have to have an accurate inventory of your assets. You should centralize the tracking of the assets. You need to have software license management in place, especially important you know, with, with vendors coming in and doing audits. And you might be surprised that you have some, some dollars on the table that you have to provide those vendors if you're not tracking your licenses. Um, there's vendor management included as well as the uh, lifecycle planning. And if you do ITAM right, it's going to help organizations make informed decisions regarding their asset procurement, the utilization of the, the assets, and the retirement. And by effectively managing these IT assets, businesses can improve operational efficiency, reduce costs. A big thing these days is mitigating security. And, and I know, Jack, we're going to be talking about the security side of things, um, as well as ensuring regulatory compliance. Anything you wanted to add to that definition, Jack? I, I think that's the perfect definition, quite honestly, David. I can check every one of those items off the uh, off the list of how it was prevalent in 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 our little effort. So I, I agree with that hundred percent. Yeah, and just to actually make things to clarify things, one of the things that we're going to be doing today is is talking about a specific project that Jack has been involved with uh, around managing assets at Randstad. Uh, one thing I'd like to do for some audience interaction uh, before we get started is to just throw in a question. How would you rate the maturity of your IT asset management process? Um, Catherine is going to place in the chat a URL. That URL will take you to a page where you can give your vote. And the, the answers are as follows. Uh, number one, our IT asset management process is unpredictable and reactive. We have an IT asset management process. How off, however, it's often circumvented. We have a well-defined and adhered to process. It's often very proactive. And our IT asset management process is measured, controlled, and continuously improved. So again, if you just can pop over to the chat, click on the URL, you'll be able to vote. And I'm just going to switch over to another screen here, and we'll see some of the votes coming in. I'll let it go for about 30 seconds or so while people um, respond. Uh, once I see the responses settling down, I'll, uh, I'll freeze the poll. Yeah, we just looks like we have a couple more coming in. It's interesting to see everything dynamically change, but it's also very interesting to see where the bulk of the answers are falling. Any surprises with that so far, uh, Jack? Not so far. Um, I, actually, yeah, I, I I am surprised by the uh, by the maturity of some of the respondents. Yeah. Okay, why don't we hold it off here, um, so you can freeze the poll just to talk about this. So it looks about uh, about 68 percent are relatively immature. I mean, I I don't mean that as a as a negative comment, but you know, it's just going looking at these results. Um, so having a process that's unpredictable and reactive and one that's often circumvented. Um, we've got 17% who have a well-defined and adhered to process. Um, it's often proactive, that's great. And 14% of the respondents say they have a, a very mature, measured, continuously improved process, which, uh, which is outstanding. Um, the thing, I, I guess, you know, we're going to be coming at this from a variety of, of the conversation today from a variety of aspects, you know, cost, productivity, and security. I think, you know, these days, Jack, I mean, you can throw in a comment here, but I think security is really high on the list of asset management projects. Would you agree with that? 
If it's not, it should be. It, it yeah. should be driving virtually everything to a large degree these days. Yeah, and we're going to really cover some of you know why we see security being a, a real driver for asset management projects. So why don't we get into our conversation here, Jack? So as I mentioned, you know, Jack's been involved in a big IT asset management project. It's uh, relatively early. Um, you're still early in the project, but why don't you talk a little bit about the project, uh, share that with us, and the goal, uh, starting with the goal of the project and maybe a little bit about um, the scope of the project as well. Sure, absolutely. Um, so I guess to, to really paint the right color for the goal, let's talk about the scope. We decided to chunk out ITAM into, uh, uh, into different pieces and we chose to start out with uh, hardware and in particular, uh, laptop provisioning throughout Randstad US. Uh, so the, the overarching goal is really to account for all deployed laptops in Randstad US uh, to communicate the single uh, production process um, for provisioning and recovery of laptops throughout the United States. So what? how, how many laptops are we talking about here? Thousands. Um, and, and the reason that I don't have a definitive number is quite honestly, it's with, with a company as large as ours that's constantly um, contracting to place talent in different locations, uh, quite often they require Randstad laptops as part of that contract. Um, so as, as we're talking now, um, guaranteed, they're, they're working on provisioning for another OPCO and another contract. Um, so, you know, it's, it's in the, the upper thousands uh, at any given time. It's really a, a lot to account for. So that's interesting. So many of these assets actually don't belong, but they belong to Randstad, but they're in the hands of third parties. Um, contractors for the most part, right? And, and FTEs alike, but um, uh, it's very dynamic. So you'll sign a contract to place X amount of uh, talent with them, you know, starting next week. And if they require laptops, uh, we need to have the ability to get them in their hands um, you know, with the full process ready to go. Um, it's pretty impressive. And, and then the fact that these are contractors must bring some really interesting challenges to the whole process as well. Absolutely. Um, you know, it, it, certainly you don't feel that same control, if you will, or that same level of comfort as you would with uh, full-time employees that you've uh, known and loved for a number of years, right? So everything is net new. Uh, so we're really reliant on solid process uh, and solid policy, right? And, and more important, the understanding of what that is and uh, depending on your role, how to see it and use it, right? Practice it. Right. So given that scope, um, how would you summarize the goal then of the project? So the, the goal is really so that, that we understand exactly where each laptop is throughout its life cycle. Um, and, and that we um, are very agile in our ability to, uh, um, to put the builds together, to provision them, um, and, and to make sure that there's a full understanding of the recovery process up front and what everybody's roles and responsibilities are. I would say that's really it in a nutshell. So let's talk a, a little bit about, so this is a pretty m massive endeavor. Um, can we talk a little bit about, you know, the type of sponsorship? Where was, where did, where did the sponsorship for the project come from? What, what area within Randstad? Maybe a little bit about the buy-in from the different groups that were involved. Sure. Um, I would say largely this was driven by information security. Uh, in fact, our, our sponsor was our chief uh, information security officer, Gretchen Hiley. Um, you know, as you alluded to earlier, um, really risk management, right? And, and information security is, is the driver behind so many things today. And this was really no exception. Um, we certainly attained buy-in from all the other executives because it made so much sense uh, to be able to, to make sure that we can account for these. Uh, number one, that things aren't falling into the hands of bad actors, right? 
that that would uh, keep anybody in in infosec up at night um but also the financial aspect right potentially leaving money on the table if you don't know what's out there um how how can you um you know you, you're constantly going back to uh to buy and provision more and send them out right so um there there needed to be a process in place so that we could accurately do this from a financial advantage as well right so the cio buys right in uh your financial folks buy in and and that was the case here as well you know it's interesting you know we talked a little bit about security when we were you know first introducing you um where do some of the risks that you guys face from a security perspective with these laptops being deployed? Well, having personal information, right, number one, or, or proprietary information uh, about the company itself, um, being like uh, every other company our size, there's a large degree of, of single sign-on uh, available, right? So mm -hmm. the thought that a bad actor might uh, obtain one of these laptops and, and get in and then have, uh, you know, basically the keys to the kingdom for some of the operating companies, uh, that's pretty hair raising, right? So, so, uh, that's a risk that we're always looking to, uh, to head off and mitigate, uh, before it happens. Not, not to mention that if we, uh, if, if we were to basically put out personal information about our employees, our talent, uh, our clients reputationally, the, the damage that that would do would, uh, would take years and years to overcome. Right. So again, you know, not these, these, the, the assets are being placed in the hands of contractors, which again, are you, you sure you have a contract with these contractors, you know, you have some sort of legal agreement with them, but again, they're not direct employees of Randstad. So a little harder to control and a little harder to manage. Right. Well, I'd, I'd say one one thing that's impressive about the uh, the Randstad business is their uh, their background checks, the way that they can turn these uh, these things around in a heartbeat. Basically, um, certainly gives you as much comfort as possible. As I say, never, you know, to it's not quite the same as someone that you work across from, you know, for five or ten years, but it allows you to at least. Um, get the most information that you can, uh, basically, you know, in a moment's notice to give some comfort that the, the folks that you have out there are, uh, are ethically following your, your policies in an agreement and just, you know, basically not bad actors, right, is what I'm saying. Did you have any challenges um, with any of the different groups you worked with to get their buy-in to be part of the project? I, I'd say that, um, you know, the ongoing challenge with all of them is being able to tap people uh, and get their time as you need it, you know, due to competing efforts, right? And and that's that's the same for any project anywhere. Um, all the companies are lean and mean. Everybody's wearing multiple hats. Um, so to, to be able to uh, impress upon the groups that you need the importance of this and the timing, um, and I, I have to say, at, at Randstad US, the professionalism is uh, is is pretty great. So we were able to get uh, buy-in from all the groups and get their time virtually as needed, which was tremendous. Not always the case. That's great. It's always it's always a blessing, like you said, to have that kind of support. It's rare. <laughs> it is rare. Um, could you talk a little bit about the development of the ITAM process? And what I mean by that is, you know, back from the days when we used to do consulting work, we'd often do some, you know, as is discovery. So what's currently being done, uh, you know, we would get different people involved uh, as we assess the different artifacts, the different systems, tools, and steps in the process, you know, bringing people together to look at opportunities for improvement. So. Can you just talk in general about how that process was developed and how you, you know, kicked off the project and how you got to the ITAM process that you have today? Sure. Um, I, I think, you know, it, it's funny. Everything revolves around uh, other circumstances. We were we were playing with some of the major processes at the time. You know, the usual suspects tightening up on. Uh, uh, incident problem change, uh, knowledge management, 
and we had just done a, a rather large survey um, on those. So I really had to think long and hard, did, did we want to go forward with another ITAM survey and hit a lot of the same people? Uh, although I needed those results, I decided it, it might be um, counterproductive, um, you know, and start to sound like the Charlie Brown teacher, you know, wah, wah, wah. Mm -hmm. I, I didn't want to lose that. So we really went informally, asked the people that uh, would be stakeholders uh, and or users if they were familiar with the process. Where does the process live? How could they touch it? Is there one? Is it written on the back of a cocktail napkin, right? The usual the usual things. Uh, what was the conduit for communication uh, around these processes? So it, it was basically the same outcomes, David, but a, a very informal way of operating and, and surveying. So it was mostly uh, reaching out ad hoc via text and email um, and, and trying to piece together the same result. Um, and, and not surprisingly, um, as in almost any, any company, communication largely was the was the uh, thing that we had to fill, right? Uh, otherwise, as you well know, your processes become deskware, right? They, they wind up, uh, you, you get the best process on earth, but if people don't know where it exists, who owns it, and how do you follow it? What does it mean to me? Um, you know, it's, it's collecting dust somewhere. So that, so that did you find did you find like there were pockets of process in the organization or that you know certain groups weren't aware of different you know how the process worked since there's an ever-changing landscape uh among these operating companies and and uh there, there's been a lot of mergers and acquisitions um and i've i've seen that before in my career that's a real challenge right because there, there's just this um this understanding, well, we've always done it this way. So I know there's a process, right? Um, you know, so-and-so said, this is how we do it. So this was no surprise, right? right. Um, overcoming that was was fairly easy. Um, and, and just being able to make sure that we impressed on everyone that now there is one process. Here's where you go. Here's who owns it. Here's how you ask questions. And, and the racy, you know, tells the story of who needs to do what going forward. Um, that that was probably the, the typical challenge that we had to overcome. So once you did that discovery and, and had a sense of how things were being done today, um, what was your next step to, to sort of begin the development of the, um, of the new process? We huddled up with these subject matter experts and I, I was delighted to find that um, really, uh, the procedures and the documentation that they had on it was was outstanding. Um, so there was really very little change in in that part. Um, a lot of it was reverse engineering and and getting these um, these down in the weeds uh, instructions, if you will, up to a level you know suitable for uh, an easy follow easy to follow process. But the subject matter experts delivered. They never missed a meeting. Um, they constantly dug in and brought us more information and uh, more procedures. It was uh, it was pretty tremendous. You know, it's it's funny you mentioned that you know process versus procedure. Many organizations have a wealth of procedures on how to do things. Like how do I deploy an asset or how do I put an asset tag on an asset? But what's missing is that whole end to end picture to see where you know where the delays in the process might be, for example, or where there's opportunities for improvement. You, you can't see a process from a pile of procedures. You have to actually lay out the process in a big picture. And I think, you know, just from my experience, you know, working with clients and prospects and whatnot, there seems to be, you know, a lot of procedures in the world, but little light on the process side of things. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. And, and it's a double-edged sword, right? Having a, a great high level process is is necessary right. but but if you're not able to get down into the operational procedural level it, it's it's another non-starter right exactly. I, I think being an outsider if you will not being the subject matter expert on this i i think helps me a lot because i'm able to answer uh ask questions rather from from the business or outsider perspective right so i found that asking the right questions helps us to put together a process that's that's fitting for basically 
every stakeholder, right? And and usually it's more business friendly and easier to follow. Exactly. I'm going to pause for a moment because we do have a few questions that came into the uh, the Q and A section. Um, so. Did you have a certain standard? Uh, this is from Amy. Uh, what is your number one subject for standards development? And do you think it's beneficial for a large organization? So not quite sure on the question there. Uh, I, I, we, I'm not, are we talking about st maybe Amy, if you could do us a favor and maybe put something in the chat, just clarifying what, what you actually mean by standards development. Do you talk, are you talking about, standard asset types or the process itself. But while you do that, I'm going to move over to Stephen's uh, question. You know, having to deal with so many assets, um, how do you deal with the human error aspect that can happen? Do you have an automated system that can take out the human errors? So in, in this particular effort, um, we had the Avanti um, ITAM, the Avanti system with the, the ITAM module. Mm -hmm. um, so as much as possible, right? The the process is baked into that uh, ITAM module, right? Which which allows us to have repetitive steps automated um, for quickness and accuracy, right? So I, I think, in all honesty, any time that your process uh, engages people in in input or output or doing something there, there's no guarantee that it's going to be perfect every time we're you know we're human after all um but being able to eliminate human error at a uh, repetitive level if you will right by by utilizing the right tool set um allows us to at least in, ensure that we're eliminating that where we can, where it makes most sense. I, I hope that made sense. Yeah. I think so just to, to clarify, clarify, just just to clarify a little, Jack. So when an asset's procured, that's registered in into Avante. Uh, asset tags are probably printed at that point before. Correct. And 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 then when a request comes into deploy, that's managed through Avante, so we know which asset with a tag is sent to a certain person, and that can be also, you know, what status it's in, deployed or if it's in. Right. Yeah. Okay. So right. you're, and you're assigned to a person, of course, right? So, so this way, there's no question that that laptop five five one one seven three, you know, is is in the hands of of Joseph Smith at X location, um, and it's active, and they're an active employee, right? Um, things of that nature. The the automation can take away human error as much as possible. Um. Another question here is um, I, ITAM clearly involves a lot of change management. I, I, I think in this question, it, the, um, and this is from Aya, uh, referring to organizational change management, I think from this perspective, and with an operation as wide as Randstad, how did you roll out the new process and, and what was the timeline to, you know, the stabilization of that process? So I, I think it's quite honestly, it's too early in the game to say that we're we're stable and we're home free. Mm -hmm. um, I, I would say the the phase we're in now is is communicating um, the process to all. Um, obviously, we we rolled in the stakeholders, the major stakeholders, as as part of the rollout, right? So they're aware. Um, but quite honestly, only only time will tell if we're communicating this properly to the right people. Uh, and, and it's accepted a hundred percent. It seems to be at the moment, but honestly, it's too early to tell and, and much too early to say we're in a stable, you know, uh, a stable state with this. So what kind of, what kind of things have you done from an organizational change management perspective to communicate the process? So the, we're utilizing the, uh, the intranet, uh, for Randstad number one, to make sure that we're, we're basing the process itself, the procedures, um, putting out, you know, did you know, and, and making sure that everyone that needs to see it is pointed back to that. So we've got a, a standard message that we're communicating um, using the company's intranet, right, for, for all employees. Um, other than that, the folks that we rolled in as, as stakeholders were, uh, were made aware that this is where we're you know, this is the portal that we're rolling out the information going forward. And it's just a matter of 
backing that up um, consistently and making sure that we're pointing everyone that needs to see it there, right? So that that's the culture change, making sure that there's information updated often, um, that it's accurate, and, and that we get everyone looking for that one place to find that information on all processes going forward. Did you, um, in the development of the process, did you start with any, any standard uh, templates or anything of that nature to, um, uh, you know, as a starting point to see the to see the big picture. We did. We did. We took advantage of the uh, uh, the templates, the standard templates in in Navi, as a matter of fact. Um, and and really, because this was a a, I guess a a narrow slice, if you will, of ITAM, it wasn't appropriate end to end. But what it did, and, and by what I mean by it wasn't appropriate, it, it was probably too much, right? Mm -hmm. So in, in a big bang sense, this, this allowed us to see everything soup to nuts. Me, the value that I really got out of it was the inputs and outputs that are readily available, um, the flow back and forth between the tools um, in, in the lines of, of the Navia templates were invaluable, right? So that that helped to keep me honest and make sure that I was um, putting something in that will fit perfectly within the larger picture, if you will, if that makes sense, David. Sure. Now, you know, you talked a little bit about at this stage of the project. So can you just sort of provide some, uh, you know, some insight into where you are right now? So because this is part of ideally you're going to be looking at all assets at, at some point in time. But where are you kind of today? So today we're in the we're in the communication phase, right? We're we're fully communicating the process out to have that one ring that binds them all effect, right? Yeah. Um, making sure that all pockets of rents that no matter where you sit, will know that this is where you go to find the processes, right? And in particular, um, this this ITAM hardware uh, laptop deployment process. And and so once. Um once the ITAM laptop deployment aspect is all settled, are you looking to expanding the scope of the ITAM process to other asset, asset classes? Absolutely. In fact, we're, we're chomping at the bit from a financial perspective to get the um, uh, ITAM software licensing, as you alluded to earlier, to get that off the ground because we think financially, that's probably the biggest bang. Um, you know, so so not going too far afield, um, we had to reel ourselves in a few times. Um, but we really feel that 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 will not only complement this effort, um, but from a from a financial savings perspective, um, this will be the cherry on top of the cake, if you will. Um, Kevin just threw out a question regarding you know the relationship of what you're doing to the CMDB. So are all your are, are all these assets contained within the CMDB within, within the Avante solution? Kevin, I would love to say uh, that that was the case, but it's not yet. Um, so Randstad, global Randstad um, right now is working with a, uh, with a CMDB in service now. Um, Randstad US is not at the moment, right? So um, although we're utilizing the, uh, the benefits of the Avanti ITAM, um, process, which is great in its own right. Um, we have not broken ground yet on a, on an actual CMDB, um, much to our chagrin. Um, but that's there, there's plans moving forward to get to that place. So Obviously it, this will be manual until then. Yeah. But, but you do have, you, um, while it may not be a CMDB, you do have a, a, um, a database of all of the assets within the Avante asset management solution. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. Do you, um, is part of the ITAM process controlling the assets like configurations and that sort of thing? And again, um, you know, the person, this is from Richard, he put up, um, he, he put up some talk about PC servers. Um, again, the scope of the project that Jack was working on was primarily deploying assets to, you know, tens of thousands of talent, uh, people being deployed at different sites. But do you also control different configurations? So are there different flavors of laptops for different um, audiences or different stakeholder groups? 
Yes, there's def there's um, uh, predominantly three different builds, right? So there's Windows, there's MacBook, and there's Chrome. Um, okay. So there's there's three different flavors that go into into this effort. Um, I heard servers mentioned, and we're looking at um, shortly after kicking off the uh, software licensing effort, we're going to uh, try to get the servers under management as well, right? That, and that's why my reference back to the template, um, the Navia template, uh, really comes in because looking at the looking at where we are with the end in mind to make sure that we're not going crazy to something that won't fit in, right? When it's all said and done, I'm hoping that all these processes will stitch together much like the end-to-end -end template that's available in, in Navia. So that's that's sort of what I meant by when I said it'll keep us honest to keep us from going too far or biting off too much more than we can chew. Now, it's interesting, you know, at the beginning of the conversation, when you describe the, the Randstad business, I mean, you're putting people into into sensitive organizations, financial services, healthcare. Um, there's regulatory compliance in those industries, things like you know HIPAA and the healthcare industry, privacy, you know GDPR. Um, yep. do, do does how does that factor into the assets and um, and perhaps how you configure and deploy them? I, I think it's um, it, it probably factors in much more around the destruction, right? Um, and, and wiping them, right? So you need to be in, in compliance with GDPR, um, with DOD, with SOX, uh, with HIPAA, um, PCI, DSS, right? If you're in the financial realm where you're dealing with uh, credit card information where some of the talent is, of course. That's interesting, yeah. Um, you know, and then attaining that certification, right? So each one, we have to have a, a certificate back that says that it was handled by this our, our third party um, recovery organization, um, that it was handled the right way, that it was wiped or that it was wiped and destroyed. Right. Well, that's really interesting. So that adds a whole other layer of complexity. So, uh, again, coming back to the whole security and privacy perspective these assets because they you know they have the sso integration because they can get into you know, potentially into your clients systems into randstad systems you got to make sure and be able to have evidence that these machines have been properly handled absolutely absolutely and and choosing a a certified third party um you know to do that work on our behalf is is essential uh one other question before we move on um so you're you're you know you're at the stage where you're communicating the process, but how much time did it take for the development of the process before this communication phase started? I, I would say it was probably three to four months mm -hmm. from from the time we broke ground, if you will. We did the the background work and started to reach out to uh, potential stakeholders till the time we uh, uh, we had the process in production, if you will. Um, just moving on to, in the interest of time, moving on to the next slide, um, I'm sure everyone's really interested in knowing the benefits that you obtain from all of this work. So what are some of the, what are some of the key benefits you've seen to date? Well, obviously that, that level of comfort from an InfoSec perspective, um, is, is there, right? Knowing that this is being handled properly each time, every time, right? in a consistent man manner. Um, and also working with that that uh, third party um, presents to us a unique financial opportunity as well, right? As they go through and uh, as the laptops are recovered, if they're not able to, uh, there's there's a checklist that, um, that the folks go through to see if the laptop can be redeployed, right? And if not, there's a magic number that they reach. I think it's uh, 250. Once they have 250, um, they order a pickup. The third party will come in and pick up the uh, the lot of 250 at a time. Um, they'll go through it for parts. Um, they'll wipe them. They'll do the uh, destruction and, and recycling where that's uh, where that's necessary. And then on the back end, um, there's a settlement check right that comes back to uh, to Randstad. Um, so really by leaving these things in a, in a slightly unmanaged state, 
or or not being able to turn them around quickly uh, as soon as a contract ends or as soon as uh, uh, someone is termed, for example, you're leaving money on the table, right? So so the sooner that we can get them in, the sooner we can redeploy or determine that they need to be recycled, you know, there's a financial incentive on the back end of that. And that's that's a great benefit, not only knowing where everything is at all times, but being able to recoup what we can, uh, redeploy what we can, and, and then get a settlement on, on the rest. Yeah, and we're not without going into the specifics of what that is, but is that look like a substantial monetary savings that you're, you're realizing from the project? Over time, absolutely, right? And, and, and the positive settlement versus the, you know, we've got a bunch of things, we're not sure kind of where they are right now. <laughs> you know, again, that leaves money on the table. So in, in these days when you're tightening your belts and, and sharpening your pencils everywhere financially, um, being able to consistently have this coming back in, it definitely makes a difference. So another question just came in around the data destruction piece. So given the data destruction is done by a third, uh, uh, so just confirming the data destruction is done by a third party. Uh, if so, who's liable in the case of a data breach? Hmm. Boy, now you're going to keep me up at night with that question. That's <laughs> well. I guess I guess the, the person who you went to to do the, to the wipes and destructions is certified to do that type of work. Absolutely, and they're highly vetted, as as are all of our uh, our vendors. Um, but extremely so to a, a critical process and a critical vendor like this. Um, we we definitely feel that we have the best choice. Um, our, our contract is tight enough that, um, um, you know, that we're not worried. Um, ultimately, in, in a breach situation like that, all, all parties would be liable. Mm -hmm. um, moving on, um, would you like to share any of the challenges and lessons learned from, from the project? If you, you know, had to go back and do it again, what are some of the things you might do a little bit differently? Sure. I, I think the largest challenge, and I already alluded to it before, was was to try to not get ahead of ourselves. Um, it, it was so tempting from a from a financial aspect to sort of roll the um, roll our next project with uh, software licensing in with this one to make a bigger bang. But I, I don't think it would have been as accurate. Uh, I'm not confident that that all parties would have been able to come to the table at the same time. So, you know, I, I think the challenge is not being your worst enemy and trying to bite off more than you can chew um, to, to lay this out in a, uh, in a manner um, that you can put a good timeline around it and deliver. I, I think that's, that's always the challenge. Mm -hmm. um, as far as lessons learned, um, uh, again, to to sort of keep maintain that outsider almost um, um, almost thinking of myself as a consultant to, to keep that level with each of these projects I think will uh, um, will pay off for us because I'll just be asking the right questions and and not getting too deep in the weeds with the results. Does that make sense? Oh, totally. I mean, I'll just comment on both of those things. I mean, first of all coming at it like a consultant, I think makes perfect sense because it, you, you, sometimes you get the subject matter experts and they're going to go right to the weeds of how it's done and, and lose sight of the big yeah. picture. But acting as a facilitator, you can ask those questions, talk about the big picture. What are the inputs? What are the outputs? How are we going to control this process? Um, secondly, to your scope creep thing, I think that's one of the number one reasons process implementations fail is because they try to bite off more that they can chew. So, I mean, obviously you're beginning to see some, some quick wins from this particular project. Um, and this is going to help support you moving forward to the next phase, the next phases, uh, most notably with the, I mean, software license management, there's a huge opportunity for cost, uh, cost avoidance or cost savings with that. And um, yeah, so biting off more than you can chew is, is a surefire way of having a, a poor process deployment for, and, uh, you know, taking that consultative approach, I think was a really, you know, a really excellent way of approaching it, Jack. 
Thank you. I, and it's hard when you have opinions, you know, when you've been around, you have your own opinions on things. And, uh, you know, it's human nature to think, well, I have some expertise. So it's kind of keeping yourself in check and keeping that mind space. I think that's, uh, that's going to help us going forward. Um, we had quite a number of questions coming in throughout the, um, the presentation. I was wondering if there's, if there's any other questions, we'll, we'll be able to field those questions um, now um, and you know, through to the end of the conversation. But if there aren't any at the moment, what I'd like to do is just take a moment. And uh, you know, Jack alluded to some of the templates uh, that uh, he was following for asset management. I just wanted to share some of that with you. And what I've done here is I put a little example together for IT asset management. And I've taken two of our templates. So the idea would be to use Navia much like, you know, you would use a tool like Visio or something, but it, it worked to document your processes. Um, but with Navia, you can start from a library of various uh, process templates. So I have an example here of the software asset management template and the hardware asset management template. Those, um, those templates can be loaded up into Navia from various libraries of different, um, of different process templates, ITEL based templates, ServiceNow based templates, COBIT, or some business process templates from the APQC framework. So a lot of different process templates you can start with. And when you um, load those templates in, it gives you a baseline from which you can build and develop your own process. So if we take a look at the hardware asset management process here, it gives a, a brief description. You know, the hardware asset management tracks accurate and complete financial, contractual, and operational information about hardware assets and their relationships to CIs. We have a little bit here on the goal of asset management is to ensure that the life cycle of all hardware assets um, are managed. We have some various objectives that assets are recorded uh, to identify assets to be refreshed or retired, maintain maintenance and lease agreement information, capture purchase order, et cetera. We have a whole list of different roles in the process with a description of what each of those roles are. And the idea would be to work through some of this information, like the description, goal, objectives, roles, um, and, and come to some sort of consensus uh, in your organization of how, uh, you know, so either use these roles and, and, and descriptions and scope and objectives or modify them to meet your own needs. In addition to this overview information, we provide a detailed flow information so we broke the process down into a request for a hardware asset, the sourcing of the asset, the procurement of the asset, how you receive, store, and transfer the assets, the move, add, change of the asset, and basically goes through all of the high-level steps of asset management to provide you know, assets for refreshment, retirement of the asset, disposal of the asset, maintaining hardware product models, maintaining stock rules. Uh, so a very comprehensive process that takes you from beginning to end, uh, the entire you know cradle to grave, so to speak, the entire life cycle of the process. For each of the um, steps in the process, we allow organizations to capture a significant amount of detail. So for example, um, if you're looking at submitting the request for hardware, you can actually break that down into um, a, an entire description of how that task is performed by, in this case, you can see in the swim lane here, the requester. You can also scroll down through Navia and identify um, duties by role, the inputs, the outputs for each of these steps. Um, and if you're going to be customizing this process for implementation in a tool, you can even capture user story information to provide developers with the, the level of information they need to implement a process like this in, in the appropriate um, system. Um, you can even get down to procedural information. And, you know, Jack and I, we talked earlier about, you know, process versus procedure. Well, the process gives you this nice big end to end view, but you can drill right down to the procedural information so that it's linked to the process. So you know exactly what step in the process these procedures are met. And then what Navia does with all this information is allow you to slice that slice and dice that into various documentation. So if you want to produce a process guide, you can go ahead and produce a process guide. Um, creates a Word document for you, uh, puts a description of the process, the roles, 
inserts the RACI chart for the process all automatically. You don't have to create any of this. Inserts the diagrams and then allows you to go through and have a list of all of the detailed steps within that particular process. Um, if you'd like to bring up just a dedicated RACI chart, you can bring up a dedicated RACI chart for the process and see specifically all of the activities in the, and tasks within the process, as well as a list of the various roles. And just let that generate here. Um, so you can see all the different roles across the top and you can navigate through this and see exactly um, who's responsible for what and where they're responsible to do it. A whole host of different reports you can pull out. With Navia, there's an, an extensive amount of information, inputs, outputs, controls, metrics, policies, how you govern the process, all in the database. And then you can configure different documents and reports to be produced. If you want to see things like technical specifications, you can actually see um, a complete list of, 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 of starter user stories to configure this process in a tool. So very, very comprehensive template that provides a wealth of information that can be completely modified and then shared through a central portal with everyone in your organization so that you have a consistent process communicated to all and you know easy to maintain and manage because all of the documentation is produced from the central repository um, depending on the type of information you're looking for. So that's a little bit about the Navia process designer. Um, if you're interested in learning more about the Navia process designer, uh, you could you could um, there's you can go to our website and and um, and put in a trial request, or you can actually contact us if you would like you know to receive a personalized demonstration of the product. I just sort of glossed over it very quickly here today, but the Navia process designer will help you with process design and sharing, user story and requirements, gathering, assessment and governance of your processes. And it does that through a whole, a whole host of templates that we have built into the tool. And together that helps you drive value in your process design and implementation projects. Um, again, if you want to learn more, go to navia.com slash contact, and we'd be happy to set up a demonstration for you and your team. I mentioned this was the sixth webinar of the year. We do have one more that's coming up on uh, December 7th. That's Leading Digital Transformation. Registration for that webinar will be opening soon. So uh, we're at the top of the hour here. Um, we'd be happy to take any additional questions if you have any. Um, so I'll stick around. Jack, you'd be happy to stick around for a bit? Absolutely, I'd be happy to, David. Okay, um, but um, just allow everyone to get going and on with their day. I, first of all, I want to say thank you so much for your time, Jack. It was a pleasure to talk with you today and to learn a little bit about the asset management project at Randstad. And um, yeah, it was just great. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much. Always my pleasure, David. Always a pleasure to talk to you. I always learn something new. <laughs> thank you. I, I could say the same. All right, um, it doesn't look like we have any additional questions at this time. Just as a reminder, there will be a link to the recording uh, of this uh, webinar going out uh, before uh, sometime this afternoon or tomorrow morning. So take a look at that. If you'd like to um, get access to our other webinars, just go to navia.com slash blog. There's a, little, um, there's a little menu item for webinars and you can see some of the past webinars that we've had. I'd like to thank you all for joining us today. I appreciate your interest and wish you all a wonderful remainder of your day. Bye for now. Thanks everyone, bye now.